Excellencies, ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this OECD high-level event, Shaping a Just Digital Transformation. Bienvenue à cet événement au niveau de l'OECD pour une transformation numérique juste. My name is Ida McDonnell. Uh, I'm the team lead and managing editor of the OECD's Development Cooperation Report, and the 2021 edition is informing uh, the, today's event. We are delighted to have so many participants joining us today with over 600 people registered for the event. Thank you for joining us um, and uh, great to have you here. Please note uh, that the question and answer function is available, so please feel free to submit questions. As we have a packed agenda today, it may not be possible to respond during the event, but we will endeavor to do so afterwards. Please also interact with us on social media, at OECDDev, and with the hashtag digital transformation. We are live streaming on our YouTube channel, which you can find searching OECD development. So you can watch back and share the event later. Simultaneous interpretation is available in English, French, and Spanish. And details on how to access the interpretation are in the chat function on Zoom. I'm delighted now to share with you an address from the OECD Secretary General, Matthias Kormann. Uh, excellencies, dear colleagues, thank you for your participation in the launch of this report, Development Cooperation 2021 for a Just Digital Transformation. Helping to shape a just digital transformation is a high priority for the OECD. Our member countries, as well as our key partners, have been and continue to be at the forefront of developing common digital standards to harness the benefits of digital transformation while also better addressing some of the risks, challenges and disruptions associated with it. The OECD supports governments to better understand and manage this transformation. We are a recognised source of international standards in this area. The COVID-19 crisis has further accelerated what was already a rapid pace of digital transformation, with evolutions in 5G, artificial intelligence, robotics and the Internet of Things the pace of change has truly been exponential. This is particularly the case for developing countries, many of which are looking to leapfrog old technologies and to embrace new ones to future-proof their economies and societies. A digital technology brings governments and citizens closer together, opens new economic opportunities, improves access to education, healthcare and other services, promotes transparency and offers platforms for discussion and dissent. Internet connectivity is now a necessity and a development goal. As a global leader in setting international standards for the digital transformation, the OECD is experiencing a new level of demand for cooperation with developing countries, from knowledge sharing to policy development and organizational support. While some parts of the developing world are rapidly gaining ground, overall, the digital divide between advanced economies and low- and middle-income countries is increasing. In 2021, 90% of people in OECD countries reported using the Internet, compared to just 27% in least developed countries. The impacts of the global digital divide are significant across all sectors. For example, while access to technology is widespread in schools in advanced economies, just over a third of schools in developing countries have internet access. The digital transition is also closely intertwined with the energy transitions. Without access to reliable, affordable electricity, the economic, social and environmental benefits of digitalization will remain out of reach. And beyond digital infrastructure, other barriers are keeping economies and societies locked out of digital prosperity, such as gaps in internet usage by gender, age and education level. The challenge is to collectively build practices and policies that can effectively shape the trajectory of the digital transformation so that it benefits everybody and advances value-based standards that respect human rights, the rule of law, gender equality and democracy. We want all to have the, the, the same opportunity to participate and to benefit from the digital transformation. For all these reasons, uh, today's policy choices matter. The OECD is here to help guide policy making 
through its analysis and standards, to promote a future of shared prosperity and well-being. The 2019 OECD recommendation on artificial intelligence, for example, is a prime example of a principles-based approach to technology governance. It promotes values-based principles to foster responsible and trustworthy artificial intelligence and has formed the basis for the G20's AI principles. The OECD's Going Digital Integrated Policy Framework underscores the need for a holistic policy approach to address the benefits and challenges of digitalization across sectors and policy areas. Today, I'm delighted to see our organization take a new step forward, launching the OECD Development Corporation Report 2021, Shaping a Just Digital Transformation. The report has two key messages. First, it highlights that the values that are shared by OECD members, democracy, human rights, the rule of law, market-based economic principles, and a rules-based international order, collectively provide a reliable compass for navigating the digital transformation in line with the Global Sustainable Development Goals. These same values keep data and people safe, prevent digital technology from being used as a tool of authoritarianism, and ensure that everyone has the opportunity to participate in and benefit from the digital transformation. Second, the report advocates for the voices of low- and middle-income countries to join the global digital policy debate. We need them at the table. The universal nature of the digital transformation means that new standards, norms and regulatory framework will only be successful when they take into account different contexts and capacities for implementation. I look forward to working with all of you to shape a just digital present and future to help achieve our collective goals of promoting global economic development and prosperity, which are at the heart of the shared vision, values and principles of the OECD. I wish you an excellent discussion. Thank you. So let's turn now to the fantastic lineup of speakers and I invite you all to switch on your cameras so, so the audience can, can see you. It's my, my pleasure to introduce you all. We have George Moreira da Silva, Director of the Development Cooperation Directorate here at OECD, and he will share key messages from the report in a moment. Following this, we have Susanna Moorhead, Chair of the Development Assistance Committee of the OECD, and she will also give her remarks after uh, George looking ahead for development cooperation and digital transformation. On panel one, which will discuss more inclusive digital standards, norms, and regulatory frameworks, we are joined by Honorable Minister Diataha, Minister of Digital Economy and Tele Telecommunications of Senegal. We are also joined by Honorable Minister Valderrama Royos, Minister of Information and Communication Technologies of Colombia. Welcome. We are joined by State Secretary Sancha, Deputy Minister of International Development from the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs of Norway. Ms. Nanjira Sambuli, Fellow of Technology and International Affairs at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Kamia Chandra, Fellow at iSpirit. And Elsa Pilichowski, Director for Public Governance of the OECD. This panel will be facilitated by Andrew Wyckoff, Director of Science, Technology and Innovation at the OECD. On panel two, which will discuss how development cooperation can step up to increased demand for support for digital transformation. We are pleased to welcome Honorable Minister Swahe, Minister of Information and Communications of Sierra Leone, Ambassador Lusk, Ambassador at Large for Digital Affairs of Estonia, Martin Bimmer, Chief Digital Officer of the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development of Germany, Teki Akute, Founder and Executive Director of Africa Digital Rights Hub, Ezra Chiloba, Director General of the Communications Authority of Kenya, John Giosti, Chief Regulatory Officer of GSMA, and this panel will be facilitated by Kate Wilson, CEO of Digital Impact Alliance. We look forward to hearing from each of our panelists during the event. Now let me invite George Moreira de Silva for a presentation of the key messages from the Development Cooperation Report 2021. 
Thank you, Haida. And uh, let me start by thanking all the, the panelists for accepting, accepting our invitation to, to join us uh, today. I think that the SEC general remarks made clear just now how important uh, today's event is to bring the international community closer together on uh, some key issues uh, to shape uh, just digital uh, transformation. I'm delighted um, to be with you uh, and sharing the main messages from this development cooperation a report which provides uh, the basis for today's uh, event. Uh, so I will make a, a PowerPoint presentation that I hope can help uh, um, facilitate the discussion with our excellent uh, panelists. Since the, the COVID-19 pandemic began, uh, nearly 1 billion uh, additional people uh, came online. Uh, but while almost everyone uh, in developed countries uses the internet, just over half of the people in developing countries do so. Africa has seen much progress uh, with its uh, fiber optic network increasing uh, fourfold from 29 uh, to 2019. Uh, but in 2021, just a third of people of, on the continent use the internet. Uh, this digital divide mirrors the, the two-track recovery uh, we saw from uh, COVID. Uh, while advanced economies pull ahead, uh, it is harder for low and middle income countries to recover. Now economic shocks and uncertainty uh, from the war in Ukraine are hitting developing countries hard. Uh, these divergences are likely to worsen. There is an opportunity now to invest in systems and infrastructure that contribute to shared prosperity. Digital investments can open new frontiers for trade and e-commerce, help with tax mobilization, and underpin efficient public services. In my time with you today, I would like to talk about how policy levers can unleash the transformative power of digital technology to help build resilience to future crises and shocks and strengthen global security. The international community can play its part by focusing efforts on three main areas. First, being responsive to different digital realities or contexts in developing countries. Second, managing universal risks with uh, global cooperation. And third, by supporting more gender uh, action in this field, including through a new framework for development uh, cooperation. On my first point on context, uh, to understand the scale uh, of the challenges in developing countries, let me share some data from our recently released uh, report. Without access, the potential of digital technology to open new economic uh, opportunities is not fulfilled. $1 trillion in gross domestic product has been already lost in 32 developing countries due to the gender gap in internet use. Uh, countries are also uh, foregoing significant tax revenue and uh, business opportunities. Uh, of the 20 economies with the lowest values on the 2020 uh, business to consumer e-commerce index, 18 are least developed uh, countries. Connection is crucial. Uh, great progress uh, has been made uh, with 94% of the world covered by mobile broadband connection. But nearly half of the people who have coverage do not use it. Uh, uh, there are many barriers uh, that prevent people uh, from using digital tools, uh, such as lack of relevant content, low digital literacy, and cost of data and devices. Uh, for example, uh, in the Central African Republic, the monthly cost of one gigabyte of data is $10. It is the most expensive place in the world to get connected. Let me now uh, turn to my second point on the role of global cooperation to manage uh, universal risks. While the potential of digital tools is undeniable, the risks are now uh, quite clear. Uh, all countries face the risk of increased human rights violations, cyber attacks, and cyber crime, uh, data misuse, disinformation, and the deepening of inequalities due to the digital transformation. The war in Ukraine is revealing the power and the risks of digital communica communication in conflict situations. 
shared norms and rules for governing digital technologies are needed to deal with the increasingly complex and cross-border uh, issues. Uh, these norms uh, and rules must take into account the realities uh, uh, and implementation capacities uh, in low and middle income countries and understand the digital security as a key element of global security. Without meaningful representation and voice, many low and middle income countries are currently pushed to uh, adopt inappropriate frameworks and standards that do not uh, meet their needs. Uh, only six of the 75 countries in negotiations on global role, rules on e-commerce at the WTO are African countries, for example. How can we move uh, in building inclusive global digital governance? The United Nations Secretary General Roadmap for Digital Cooperation provides an overarching uh, framework for the international community in this field. Uh, at OECD, uh, our going digital initiative, led by my colleague uh, Andy Wyckoff, that is with us today, helps all countries uh, to understand and manage the complexity of digital transformation by providing frameworks, principles, norms, and standards. But we know that we can do more. Uh, first, the OECD is well placed to produce new research and evidence to inform policy advice that countries around the world can uh, leverage to accelerate their digital transformation. Uh, it can also help to uh, make these policies more gendered uh, and coherent. Second, as you heard, have heard from uh, our SEC General, uh, Matthias Korman, the OECD can be an inclusive forum to shape a global digital future. Uh, the DAC, the Development Assistance Committee, uh, shared by uh, Susanna Moorhead, that will uh, speak shortly, has a, a unique role to support the participation of developing countries within this architecture. Inclusive uh, digital standards, norms, uh, and reg regulatory frameworks will be the topic uh, for our first panel today. And I look forward to hearing uh, the opinion and uh, the debate among the experts uh, and leaders joining us uh, today. Let me move now to my uh, third and final part of my uh, presentation uh, on the need for a new framework uh, speci specifically for developing cooperation uh, actors. A clear takeaway from this report is that digital transformation requires engagement of both policy and technology experts to make it transformative. The framework calls for development cooperation actors to apply their expertise in the issues such as inequalities, governance, and environmental considerations to this new area of work. The three key areas for action uh, are, first, uh, ensuring policies and, and partnerships uh, uh, power uh, an inclusive digital future. This means uh, moving beyond the focus on technology deployment to much more holistic strategies and partnering to avoid uh, fragmentation. Uh, second, uh, supporting national uh, and regional building blocks for sustainable digital ecosystems, for example, through support of digital public goods and to closing the coverage and usage uh, gaps. Third, uh, making uh, financing fit uh, for purpose with greater scale, innovation, and flexibility. The, Estimates in this uh, report indicate that official development assistance for digital activities more than tripled between 2015 and 2019. Providers invested a total of $18.6 billion over this period. Uh, I look forward uh, to the second panel discussion in which our speakers will debate the best ways to development cooperation to step up to increase the demand for support to digital transformation. To conclude, uh, I would like to emphasize uh, that this is a strategic moment for the international uh, community to step up action. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis accelerated uh, adoption of digital solutions. Digital technology is on the cusp uh, uh, of a new phase. And international standard setting uh, and digital safeguarding is picking up pace. Uh, this is happening without the participation of developing countries. 
now is the moment uh, to disrupt the two-track uh, recovery. The international community can shape uh, just digital transformation by responding uh, to the digital realities uh, of partner countries, working together to address universal risks that makes us all vulnerable, and finally, uh, adapting uh, frameworks in relation to policies pursued, uh, the technology supported, and the financing offered. We at OECD are convinced that digital transformation can deliver for all countries if we uh, uh, all play to our strengths, partner, and power an inclusive digital divide. With that, I hand back to uh, Ida, and I thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Many thanks, George. I'd like now to hand the floor over to Susanna Moorhead, Chair of the Development Assistance Committee, and hear from you, Susanna, on what's ahead for development cooperation and digital transformation. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ida, and, and huge thanks as ever to you and the team um, for, for doing the hard work on, on this DCR. Um, I don't want to say very much. I actually want to hear from, from, from our panelists. Um, but just a few thoughts. I mean, we know that digital transformation is, is a double-edged sword, um, but I, I mean, I'm firmly convinced that the pros outweigh the cons um, and that it's a question of, of you know, managing the downsides, not, not limiting our ambition. I mean, if I, if I look back over the, just the last 22 years, say, from, from the turn of the millennium, you know, I've seen um, doctors sitting in um, Hyderabad helping um, traditional midwives deliver difficult breech births in remote rural villages via a very an old gray and white screen, uh, but saving the life of the mother and the child. I've seen uh, mobile telephony transform the lives of slum dwellers uh, in, in, in Nairobi and indeed in remote rural areas. So even in you know, in, in some of my career, I've, I've seen the power of digital transformation um, and it is phenomenal. Um, however, the downside is that it's also very good at, at, at reinforcing existing um, institutions. And, you know, I know the report covers this. If you look at the access of men and women uh, to digital technology, surprise, surprise, uh, gender inequality is being uh, replicated um, in really quite frightening ways. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's that funny juxtaposition of, of the very modern, the very transformative, and um, the very, um, I don't want to say old fashioned, but the very current um, struggles that uh, confront, a, confront us all. Um, so what can, what can DAC members do? Uh, I mean, I think the first thing we've done, this is, this is our development cooperation report, the fact of, of having selected this as a topic, I think, demonstrates uh, that DAC members think it's important. It's about a, an awful lot more than technology transfer. I mean, that, that's the easy stuff. I think it's, as, as others have mentioned, the rules, the norms, the terms, the, the, the principles of underlining the sustainable development goals of leaving no one behind, making sure that Fragile countries, just as much as as, as uh, wealthier ones, um, have affordable access. That it reaches remote rural areas, and that it reaches women and girls um, above all. Um, I think also, I mean, I'm delighted to see some representatives of the private sector on on the panels. For me, it's it's one of the best examples of how the private sector and development cooperation can work together to make things great in some of their parts. It's a real win-win. And I, I'd be very interested to hear, you know, what, what more we can do there. I think some of the early innovative um, things we did, we didn't call it blended finance at the time, but it, it's what it was. It was trying to combine the development expertise with, with the technological innovation capability delivery of the private sector. Um, and not just... Uh, the private sector in DAC members. I mean, the, some of the most innovative entrepreneurs in developing countries got into this digital space very early on and, and they really have uh, been transformative. I think, um, you know, just, just in closing, 
It goes without saying that the, the development effectiveness principles that certainly guide everything that DAC members do are just as important in modern spaces as, as, as more traditional ones. And by that, I mean making sure that policies and programs are country-led, um, results-focused, uh, that they're genuine partnerships, that they're transparent and accountable. And I think donors uh, have more work to do to make sure that we um, are joined up and unfragmented. I mean, the, the report documents some cases uh, during COVID of different donor-supported um, digital health systems that couldn't talk to each other. It's not, you know, we can do better than that. Um, so if ever there were a need for donor coordination, it's here. I mean, as, as uh, Matthias mentioned, there, there's a, it's critically important that the voice of developing countries is heard loud and clear as we shape global norms and, and standards. Um, and I think in closing, just to say, this is, this is not an option. This is happening and it's happening an awful lot faster than most of us um, mortals can, can keep up with. Uh, so the development cooperation community in, in, in very close collaboration, say with partner countries and the private sector, have got to keep this um, absolutely uh, at the top of, of our agenda. Thank you very much. I look forward to, to hearing what others have to say. Many thanks, Susanna. With that, I would uh, like to hand over now to Andy Wyckoff, the Director of the Science, Technology, Innovation Directorate, to take us into the first panel discussion. Over to you, Andy. Thank you, Ida, George, and Susanna. It's really a pleasure to be here today to moderate this panel with such a distinguished and varied lineup of uh, speakers. Uh, it have been kind of given mission impossible here though to, to moderate this in a very short time with such an interesting group of people. So I, I ask all of them to please stick to time as much as possible. Um, and my colleagues and I will do the best to assist you. Um, <clears throat> uh, at the OECD, we consider inclusiveness to be a key policy objective. As you heard from our Secretary General, Matthias Corman, the international community must ensure that everyone, including low and middle income countries, are at the table when it comes to setting digital policy standards. Um, in this way, we can share the benefits of this uh, transition, uh, which uh, need to be more inclusive than they have been uh, to date. So the, the charge for the panel here is we want to begin to unpack uh, some of the current barriers that, that prevent this stakeholders from effectively participating and look for ways to, of overcoming these barriers. Um, uh, <clears throat> we've seen in other cases that the digital transformation holds great promise to reduce inequalities. I was originally a little bit skeptical about this term, but I've come to believe that there are in fact leapfrog opportunities here uh, with using some of these advanced technologies. We're beginning to see it a little bit with 5G, with what's so-called greenfield 5G networks, or a good example of this that's already happening um, on the ground. That said, in no way do I want to minimize the significant digital divides that uh, still exist. And some of this is just with very basic information communication technologies, not the high end. Uh, and yeah, uh, Wired connections still matter. I'm happy to see wireless provide last mile type connections that are a lot cheaper and easier to get to. But at the end of the day, all that data in the air has got to come down to the ground. And this is why fiber, uh, I'm, I believe, uh, don't want to be, I want to be technology neutral here, but fiber connections are important. In 22, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, there were 33 fixed broadband subscriptions per 100 inhabitants in the OECD countries. This compares to just 12 in the non-OECD countries. And, and that, that matters, particularly as we've seen with, with COVID. But I want to go beyond connectivity of infrastructure, because I think it's important to move beyond that. It's other issues such as privacy, security, consumer protection, and the skills to use this technology, I think, are, are, are fundamental. Uh, identifying and adopting better policies across all these areas is essential to unlock the benefits of the digital transformation for, digital, for developing countries. With that, it's my great pleasure to now turn to Minister 
Dia Terra from Senegal, who will provide keynote remarks for our panel. Minister, Senegal is not only a leading country in digital policy with its own smart Senegal program, but is also a regional leader and the current chair of the African Union. Senegal is truly paving the way for the digital transformation of the African continent. Minister, let me ask you, what have been the key success factors for Senegal so far? And what's the role for international policy standards in supporting digital transformation in Africa? Thank you, Minister. Merci beaucoup. Je vais euh, commencer par vous remercier et remercier les collègues ministres qui prennent part à ce panel, remercier les ambassadeurs, les directeurs des organisations internationales, donc les hauts fonctionnaires, remercier M. le secrétaire général de l'OCDE, mais également saluer tous les participants à ce panel. Je voudrais, au nom de son Excellence M. Macky Sall, président de la République du Sénégal, et président de l'Union africaine, remercier le secrétaire général de l'OCDE pour cette invitation. C'est pour moi un honneur et un immense plaisir donc, de prononcer cette keynote à l'occasion de cette session de haut niveau de l'OCDE, organisée en collaboration avec le PNUD, la Digital Impact Technology, donc la Digital Public Goods Alliance sur le thème d'actualité, concernant une transformation numérique juste. Aujourd'hui, le numérique s'est imposé à tous les États comme un levier incontournable de la relance de l'économie mondiale post-COVID-19, de la transformation sociétale. Cependant, force est de constater que si la COVID a joué un rôle d'accélérateur de l'adoption des technologies numériques, la fracture technologique s'est également ex exacerbée selon le rapport sur l'économie numérique 2021 de la Commission. Ainsi, les inégalités s'aggravent et les géants qui détiennent les plus grandes plateformes numériques, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, Google, Meta, Facebook, Tencent et Alibaba, pour ne citer que cela, consolident leur domination sur la, toute la chaîne de valeur mondiale des données entraînant des déséquilibres de pouvoir toujours plus marqués qui affectent une économie numérique en pleine expansion. Au dernier trimestre 2020, Quatre grandes plateformes, Alibaba, Amazon, Google et Microsoft, détenaient à elles seules 67 des revenus mondiaux en matière de services d'infrastructures cloud. Dans le même rapport, on note que seuls 20 des habitants des pays les moins avancés utilisent Internet. Mais force est de constater que cet Internet a des vitesses de téléchargement relativement faibles à un prix proportionnellement élevé. Dès lors, la gouvernance et la régulation sont devenus le nouveau théâtre des tensions entre multinationales et gouvernements, préoccupés par leur souveraineté numérique et la rentabilité des investissements consentis dans les infrastructures et le capital humain. C'est à ce titre que je salue cette approche mondiale adoptée par la Commission européenne pour une gouvernance plus numérique plus inclusive et une coopération au développement stratégique et pertinente. À cet effet, un des plus grands enjeux de nos pays et de participer à l'élaboration des normes et standards afin de bénéficier des extraordinaires retombées économiques du numérique. Cela suppose également la disponibilité des ressources humaines qualifiées d'un secteur privé innovant et fort et d'une infrastructure souveraine résiliente et des cadres réglementaires favorables à l'investissement et des services et applications adoptés à notre environnement. C'est dans cette optique que le gouvernement du Sénégal conscient de l'énorme potentiel du numérique, a fixé un nouveau cap en misant sur la transformation structurelle de son économie pour atteindre une croissance forte, soutenue et durable. Afin de promouvoir une société apprenante, une économie de l'innovation, le chef de l'État a inscrit la société numérique inclusive parmi les cinq initiatives majeures de la seconde phase du plan d'action prioritaire du PSE, cap 2 a Ainsi, le numérique est considéré comme un catalyseur de croissance et des initiatives sont prises pour l'accélération de sa diffusion dans le, tous les secteurs économiques et sociaux. Mon département a élaboré la stratégie Sénégal numérique 2025, dénommée SNV 25, dont la vision est, en 2025, le numérique pour tous et pour tous les usages, avec un secteur privé 
dynamique et innovant dans un écosystème performant. Cette stratégie s'articule autour de quatre prérequis fondamentaux et quatre axes stratégiques prioritaires. Son coût d'action. Donc, la taxe constituée de 28 réformes et 69 projets d'un coût de 1361 milliards sera mise en œuvre à l'horizon 2025. Les préalables pour la réussite de la transformation digitale sont la mise à niveau du cadre juridique et institutionnel, le renforcement du capital humain et la confiance numérique. Les axes stratégiques de la stratégie Sénégal numérique 2025 se focalisent sur les questions d'accès aux réseaux et services numériques, de la connexion de l'administration et de l'industrie du numérique, d'une innovante et créatrice de valeur et la diffusion dans tous les secteurs économiques prioritaires. Pour un secteur numérique, pour le Sénégal, en Sénégal numérique 2025, 28 réformes et 69 projets sont mis en œuvre avec comme objectif une création de richesses et d'emplois, plus de 35 000 emplois directs et indirects à l'horizon 2025, conformément aux objectifs du PS. Afin de garantir la matérialisation de cette vision, de notre stratégie nationale SNV 25 et accélérer la rentabilité des investissements et leur maintenance, l'État a décidé la création d'une société de patrimoine dénommée Sénégal numérique, SNV25, CENUM, et lui transformer, transférer les actifs des infrastructures de réseau et de fibres optiques. En outre, le ministère de l'économie et des télécommunications est en train de finaliser la construction du parc des technologies numériques dans la smart ville de Djamnyayou, dont l'une des composantes constitue donc la course d'un data center tiers 3. Mesdames et messieurs, la technologie devient progrès quand elle constitue à donner du sens à l'innovation pour l'homme, la société et la planète. Je reste convaincu que seuls les principes d'un numérique juste, inclusif et centré sur l'humain permettront à nos nations de trouver l'équilibre délicat mais indispensable entre les droits fondamentaux, la confiance et l'atteinte des objectifs des politiques et la durabilité. J'ai beaucoup d'espoir que cette collaboration entre les pays de l'OCDE et les pays en voie de développement en général et le Sénégal en particulier ouvriront de nouvelles perspectives d'échange en vue d'une meilleure contribution des pays en développement dans une gouvernance inclusive pour une transformation numérique plus juste. Je vous remercie de votre aimable attention. Thank you, Minister, and, and congratulations again on uh, the success you've had in Senegal. So now I'm going to move to, to the first round of our, our panel. And for, for most people, policy frameworks and standards can seem a bit abstract. So let's start the discussion with something more concrete. I'd like to ask all of you the same question. Could you give us one concrete answer maybe from your personal experience, how international policy standards and frameworks have developed, have helped lower middle-income countries harness the digital transformation. Again, I remind you, please keep your answers to one to two minutes start. And let's start with you, Minister Valdemara Juárez from Colombia. You have the floor. You're muted, I'm afraid. Yes, okay. Muchísimas gracias, muy buenos días y, y muy agradecidos por la invitación que nos han hecho desde la OCDE para participar en este escenario donde podemos compartir pues la gran experiencia que Colombia viene teniendo en estas materias. Y tengo que decirlo, pues los desarrollos conceptuales y de política pública que surgen de organizaciones como la OCDE y los demás organismos internacionales a nivel global en materia de transformación digital, pues han sido para nosotros un gran referente ¿sí? en el establecimiento de políticas públicas aquí en nuestro país. Por ejemplo, en el año 2019, les puedo compartir, pudimos contar con el Going Digital Review, el cual desarrolló pues, un diagnóstico sobre el sector TIC en Colombia, y unas recomendaciones y líneas de política pública que han sido de guía e inspiración a la hora de formular acciones en el país. Esas recomendaciones, como la subasta del espectro, la promoción del comercio electrónico, el desarrollo de habilidades específicas para la economía digital, el fortalecimiento de marcos de gobernanza sólido para la transformación digital, ya han sido hoy implementadas por Colombia a través de mecanismos como la subasta del espectro y la banda 
de 7 mil megas en el 2019, la expedición de documentos de política pública de transformación digital e inteligencia artificial, así como también de comercio electrónico y la creación de la Consejería Presidencial para la Transformación Digital y la creación de programas como Misión TIC, programas que van encaminados a fortalecer la transformación digital en Colombia, con lo cual, pues puedo compartirles que el Gobierno Nacional de Colombia se ha comprometido con la capacitación de más de 100 mil programadores solamente en este programa Misión TIC, este uno de muchos. Y asimismo, pues Colombia ha desarrollado su propio marco ético de inteligencia artificial, entendiendo las grandes oportunidades y los desafíos que representa el desarrollo de estas nuevas tecnologías. Eh, de esta manera, pues nos hemos venido posicionando como líderes regionales en la materia y nos hemos venido convirtiendo también en Early Adopters de las recomendaciones proferidas por la UNESCO para tal fin. De modo tal que con ello compartirles que Colombia sin lugar a duda uh, viene siguiendo la línea mundial, el desafío que nos eh, ha venido presentando la tecnología y transformándonos digitalmente para el beneficio del país y de los colombianos en particular. Thank you, Minister, and I've had the pleasure to watch the progress in, in Colombia. It's incredibly uh, in, impressive. Um, coming back to Minister Diaterra, uh, you have the floor to answer this question. Oui, je voudrais uh, vous remercier à nouveau et vous dire uh, au Sénégal l'une des principales innovations, comme je l'ai dit euh, tout à l'heure, euh, constitue donc, la stratégie Sénégal numérique, mais sur le plan de la connectivité, le Sénégal a fait des efforts énormes donc, en matière de connectivité, mais surtout en investissant dans les infrastructures. Et aujourd'hui, sur euh, les 15 000 km de fibre optique euh, que le Sénégal dispose, aujourd'hui, les 5 000 km appartiennent donc, à l'État du Sénégal que l'État a investi donc, dans les infrastructures, mais également nous avons un écosystème assez dynamique aujourd'hui au Sénégal. Où nous sommes également donc, quatre câbles sous-marins qui desservent le Sénégal. Tout cela renforce naturellement donc, les infrastructures et euh, la connectivité au Sénégal. Donc, de ce point de vue-là, le Sénégal aujourd'hui est considéré donc, comme une référence en matière de connectivité et de développement de l'économie numérique donc dans la sous-région et de plus en plus nous assistons donc à des euh, au déploiement des plateformes qui de plus en plus s'intéressent au Sénégal veulent investir au Sénégal veulent s'installer au Sénégal grâce à un environnement favorable au développement de l'économie numérique mais également grâce à des infrastructures donc de qualité donc c'est un peu cela aujourd'hui je peux dire euh, la clé du succès du Sénégal c'est que au-delà des opérateurs l'État du Sénégal a beaucoup donc, investi dans les infrastructures, mais également, nous, nous avons un cadre réglementaire adopté donc, au développement de l'économie, mais également aux nouvelles technologies, aux technologies émergentes. Tout cela favorise naturellement donc, à positionner, renforcer le positionnement du Sénégal. Nous avons également les ressources humaines. Vous savez, le Sénégal a une grande tradition donc, de formation et d'éducation. Nous avons aujourd'hui des écoles spécialisées donc, en matière de de, de, de télécommunication, de nouvelles technologies. Donc, tout cela favorise naturellement à renforcer l'expertise sénégalaise en matière d'économie numérique. Donc, en fait, c'est aujourd'hui les principaux atouts du Sénégal en matière de développement donc, au niveau donc, de l'Afrique. Thank you, Minister. And I very much agree. It's not only about supply, it's about demand and use as well. With that, let me move northern to uh, Norway and Secretary Sankar. Thank you. And uh, I'm sorry, I had some trouble with my with the sound and cameras. I hope you can hear me now. I was very, and thank you so much for the invitation. Thanks for all the good, um, good uh, statements we've heard so far and all the good examples. On the part of Norway, Digital public goods has been a big, huge priority for us for a long time. We co-chair the Alliance for Digital Public Goods together with the governments of Sierra Leone, U India, and with um, UNDP. So I was very happy to hear Director Moreira da Silva mention digital public goods in his uh, keynote um, remarks. 
And the chair, you asked for examples of, of uh, you know, specific examples. And I would like to highlight the UN Secretary General's Roadmap for Digital Cooperation, which was launched in June 2020, which presented the definition of digital public goods as open source digital solutions that are relevant to the Sustainable Development Goals and have been designed to protect privacy and user security. Um, and one specific example I think has been used in uh, during COVID has been the DHIS2 developed over time, coming out of University of Oslo, but developed together with programmers in India and in South Africa and adapted locally in more than 70 countries. Thank you. Thank you, State, State Secretary, and I'm happy to see open source alive and well. Um, uh, with that, let me talk, turn to uh, Nanjira Sambuli. Uh, what concrete can, examples can you think of, Nanjira? Well, the Alliance for Affordable Internet's uh, one for two definition of affordability has been instrumental in giving a benchmark um, to developing countries, and actually all countries really, on what it means to have a threshold of affordable internet. What is particularly encouraging about that particular framework or norm setting is that it was designed uh, or arrived at based on the experiences in developing countries primarily, and has then been advanced towards an international frame where the UN Broadband Commission has adopted it as a definition of affordable internet. And that is really a good roadmap to show how you bring um, these local perspectives that are markedly different from how the West has sort of uh, approached their uh, road to affordability, availability of internet, and to distinguish between availability, affordability, and meaningful access to the internet. Thank you so much. I, I'm really happy you, you brought that dimension into our discussion. Let me turn to Kamya Chandra from India. Kamya. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew. I think um, uh, just going off of just what Nanjira said just now as well, I think one of the most powerful international frameworks or standards that exists uh, is actually the internet itself. So if you think about the internet, it's based on the TCP IP protocol which is nothing but a technical standard on how to share a data packet from place A to place B. Uh, and you know, that standard was actually developed not by, a, it, it wasn't like a private company that like sat down and you know, invented app, an Apple computer or sat down and invented some specific hardware. It was a software intervention that wasn't even at the level of open source. Open source is still a product. A protocol is simply a language. It's a way to communicate. And now it, that is managed by the IETF, which is the Internet Education engineering, sorry, Internet Engineering Task Force. Uh, and that in body, you know, doesn't actually prescribe the standard itself. It merely delineates the process by which to design uh, international standards and brings a community of, of technologists together to sort of iterate on a standard. Uh, so I think I could talk about lots of Indian examples, but none is more powerful than, than the IETF's TCPIP protocol. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, I, with that, Last but not least, Elsa, please add to this, this conversation. Yes, thank you very much, Andy. Good afternoon, ministers and colleagues, and many thanks to uh, Susanna and George for their invitation. Just let me go one step further in what Minister Valderrama has mentioned about Colombia to give an example about the public sector. In 2014, Colombia adhered to the OECD recommendation on digital government strategies. Um, at the time, Colombia was a non-member of the OECD. Since then, we've worked hand in hand uh, to increase the capacity of the public sector in Colombia on digital issues. And the first edition of the OECD Digital Government Index, which basically measures the maturity of the design and implementation of digital government policy, Colombia had demonstrated its notable advance uh, in digital government, ranking third out of 29 OECD countries. So it's quite remarkable. And this has allowed Colombia to respond incredibly well to the uh, COVID pandemic in terms of digital government with you know, the coronavirus, uh, uh, with the visualization of data to, com to communicate government aid to local communities, decisions on quarantine and changes on public transport, support for economic reactivation, all this very, uh, made digitally uh, public. So I think that's a very concrete and very nice example of what can be achieved with international standards. Thank you, Elsa. Uh, let me move to, to round two. And true to form, I knew that was going to be an exciting first round. I knew it's going to be a challenge for me to keep, keep everyone on, on time. Uh, I, 
again, I, I encourage you try your best. Um, let's go deeper into substance. And I want to start with the state secretary Sankir from Norway, because Norway, as you said, is, is renowned for championing digital public goods. Can you tell us more about it and why it's a priority for, for your country? And more concretely, what could we do next to contribute to these global digital public goods? Thank you for that question. You know, Norway has been involved in global and digital public goods for some time. Physical examples could be, you know, vaccines, the Svalbard Seed Vault, or the Climate and Forest Initiative. But now that we're talking about digital public goods, uh, I mentioned the DHIS2, the Health Management Information System that has been uh, under development since the mid 1990s and is now being used and locally adapted. Um, in more than 70 countries. And we uh, have another example in Norway's Meteorological Institute, making climate and weather forecasting models and high quality weather data available as a digital public goods, supporting sister institutions in several African and Asian countries. And as we move to you know, respond more to the climate crisis and not least uh, increasing uh, resilience, having this data available will be important um, for all of us. We are supporting Ukrainian volunteers to translate reading books from English to, to Ukrainian using the Global Digital Library, which is a Norwegian funded and managed digital public goods and a translation um, platform. So we have lots of, of good examples. And I think what makes this interesting from an international development perspective is the potential for scale and local relevance at the same time. So comparing to physical products, digital technologies can be non-rivalrous. So one stakeholder's use of a digital solution doesn't reduce someone else's value from it, I guess the definition of, of uh, public goods. And the open source licensing, two stakeholders can make different versions of the same original technology to ensure relevance for local needs. How can we advance this? I think we need genuine multi-stakeholder efforts. So Norway, as I mentioned, has been a co-founder of the Digital Public Goods Alliance. Several members of it are speaking in the next panel. So uh, we, you know, we look forward to that, including um, Sierra Leone, Ispert and Germany, and uh, as well as um, Estonia. So I think to conclude, we need to mobilize more resources. We need to mobilize more, or to act more jointly in the form of funding, in the form of technologies, as well as policy changes. So we support the Digital Public Goods Charter as a global mobilization efforts, which you will hear more about in the next um, session and indeed in the months to come. So I hope that was a, a response to your, your question. Thank you. Uh it was a very nice, nice one. And um, uh, I, I think the digital public goods is a great segue to, to Kamya, Kamya and uh, their work at iSpirit, which inspires me. Could you tell us about how the visualization of critical sectors like healthcare and finance have benefited yeah. from knowledge sharing at the international level? Also, could you give us some examples of maybe missed opportunities due to lack of harmonization of digital policy frameworks? That's, that's a great question, actually. I think in India, we've been um, designing digital public infrastructure or digital public goods, you know, depending on the phrase you use, uh, as a means to say that the government doesn't have to deliver every end service. Rather, if you design for the, uh, the foundational tools uh, that will allow private service delivery to advance, then this might actually accelerate growth and inclusion at a much higher rate than if the government tries to deliver every service itself. And so as part of this, you know, we've designed what's called the India stack, which is, you know, three layers of uh, public goods. First is around identity, uh, where we gave a digital identity that's verifiable with an electronic KYC uh, for over 1.2 billion people. Uh, the second layer is payments, uh, where we designed a completely interoperable mobile-based payment system that now does uh, 5.4 billion transactions per month. Uh, and so every street vendor, you know, uh, most street vendors in the country now have a, a QR code sticker on their little card stall, and they're accepting digital payments on mobile that are real-time bank-to-bank. And this system has scaled up now to be 
uh, more transactions than MasterCard, uh, for example, and American Express globally. And the third layer is sort of data uh, uh, and enabling data sharing, because we truly believe that uh, it's important to keep data private and it's important to keep data protected, but it's also important to empower an individual with their data. Uh, and so they're, they should be able to use their data, for example, my data on my transactions, my data on my banking, to be able to access a service like a loan uh, without having to go through as many hoops. Uh, and so we think this kind of infrastructure is very powerful. All of it is based on you know, open protocols, similar to TCPIP, which I mentioned earlier, the unified payments interface is based on a payment protocol. Uh, and actually a lot of countries have uh, you know, legacy payment systems and that you know, going to your point on missed opportunities, uh, you know, if UPI were able to be, or UPI based protocol uh, with you know, more international governance uh, that comes in to uh, actually review it and, and have more global perspectives on what might work, if such a standard similar to the Bluetooth Alliance, you could have a payments protocol alliance, right? That ensures that payment systems around the world are operating as per the same protocol that would create huge levels of inclusion. So I think, uh, I think there's both uh, you know, scope for optimism uh, based on what's happened and what's been built in the past in terms of digital infrastructure that's operated at India scale. Uh, and and that's, that optimism I think extends to the next five, seven years as more and more countries you know, truly adopt these as as uh, as public goods and shared public infrastructure. Uh, so, yeah, is, is that all right? <laughs> Thanks. No, it's inspiring yeah. messages, particularly given the scale you're operating at, which is really impressive. Uh, Nanjira, uh, your work has highlighted the need for more inclusiveness in global technology governance. Can you help us unpack the term multi-stakeholderism and how it can converge or diverge with multilateralism, such as what's practiced at, at the OEC. How should global tech governance evolve? Sure, my, maybe my response won't end up on the same uplifting note. However, um, with multi-stakeholderism, the premise is that everybody who has a stake in the outcome of say digital transformation would be involved in its governance. And so how we've seen it uh, shape up as a mode of governance in internet governance is bringing the broad sectors, government, private sector, NGOs, INGOs, to the table to deliberate around issues, opportunities, challenges being faced, um, which has been a very interesting way to also bring perspectives that typically would not fit on a global table, so to speak, to these discussions. However, um, the, it does come up against some challenges or complications. One, what are the governance goals, even if we're discussing internet governance issues? Can these stakeholders really lead uh, after great consultations to any meaningful decision um, that then is incorporated? Essentially, multilateralism is where governments do the same thing. Multiple governments come together and deliberate and so on and so forth. Uh, the power still rests with governments um, and in, in a sense, maybe intergovernmental organizations to embody whatever are the principles or the recommendations that are put forth through these deliberate consultative processes. Um, so that intersection of multilateralism and multi-stakeholderism remains an urgent priority, even as we bring in new nomenclature like digital cooperation and development cooperation. What are the governance goals at the end of the day? Once we consult this broad stakeholder group, do they have any power to actually enforce these things? And if governments are still the ones to enforce those, how do we make sure that they do not take for granted what it means to consult uh, widely um, and to bring in especially the perspectives of the least represented. We have the other risk that starts to come up where it's the usual actors who speak. So I'm the usual representative for civil society and is the usual representative of um, uh, you know, INGOs and so on and so forth. So it is a time intensive endeavor. It is a resource intensive endeavor and it can ver it's very premise of inclusion has to be measured at every step of the way to make sure that we do not end up at the same place where it's the usual actors and we always incorporate these so-called bottom-up perspectives we really want to bring to the table. Lastly, I will just complicate it further and say, you know, it also brings a dimension between what spaces, even in the multilateral domain, these discussions on global tech governance are happening. Is it that the OECD, um, and if the OECD is the place we are going to deliberate key issues on global tech governance, are developing countries, member states, or should they have a then they're being co uh, consulted or cooperation, does that mean that they are an equal player or have an equal seat at the table and so on and so forth. So it, it becomes one step forward. Let's make sure as we do so, we do not take two steps back. Wise words and we're, we're trying, but with, with that, let me um, move to Minister uh, Vadarama Rojas uh, from, from Colombia. 
I know digital engagement is a priority for your country. Could you tell us about international frameworks that have been helpful in building Colombia's journey in this area, particularly from the perspective of a middle income country? Over to you, Minister. Minister Valderrama Rojas. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll move to Elsa while we wait. Gracias, for Andrew. Oh. Creo que ya me están escuchando. Gracias. Eh, bien, lo, lo decía que a propósito de la pregunta planteada, el elemento más importante, el que ha sido para nosotros definitivo, es la decisión que como gobierno adoptamos eh, en materia de política pública. Y por eso lo primero que la decisión de irnos por la vía de la transformación digital, de fortalecernos en ese frente. Y lo primero que quiero mencionar es que pues, Colombia en el año 2018 incluyó por primera vez dentro de su Plan Nacional de Desarrollo, que es el derrotero para fijar la política pública, eh, la política pública de cuatro años de gobierno en el Pacto por la Transformación Digital. Definió con ello pues, el marco de esa política general para impulsar la transformación digital tanto en el gobierno como en las empresas, como en los hogares y en los ciudadanos colombianos. Y este pacto pues tiene dos grandes pilares. Uno, Colombia se conecta, enfocado hacia la masificación de la banda ancha e inclusión digital de todos los colombianos. Y uno segundo, hacia la sociedad digital e industrial 4.0 por una relación más eficiente, más efectiva y transparente entre los mercados, los ciudadanos y el Estado. Esto con el fin de promover desarrollo más digital, sostenible e inclusión en el país. Y específicamente en materia de gobierno digital, pues lideramos la gran tarea de implementar la estrategia de integración digital del Estado colombiano, de todas las autoridades a nivel nacional, departamental, municipal, es decir, de regional. Lo que quiere decir es que se entregó una oferta estatal digital unificada en la cual eh, los ciudadanos puedan acceder a los trámites y a los servicios que ofrecen las entidades públicas de una manera muy sencilla, muy ágil e intuitiva inclusive. Y además eh, nos hemos comprometido con el establecimiento de marcos normativos claros que fomenten el desarrollo de esas nuevas tecnologías al servicio de la ciudadanía como lo son la inteligencia artificial, la gobernanza de datos, la ciberseguridad, los modelos ciudadanos y territorios inteligentes inclusive. Y en este sentido, pues Colombia ha sido fuertemente influenciada por experiencias internacionales, hay que decirlo, y han sido muy valiosas en la construcción de nuestra política pública, particularmente de países miembros de la OCDE. Por mencionar pues algunos ejemplos, en Colombia implementamos a partir de febrero del año 2021 el portal único del Estado colombiano, gov.co el cual pues, ha sido inspirado en, en su conceptualización y su experiencia de usuario en los desarrollos por el Reino Unido a través del portal gov.uk. Los servicios ciudadanos digitales eh, allí consignados son un, un conjunto de soluciones tecnológicas que buscan facilitar a todos los ciudadanos su interacción con las entidades públicas y de esa manera pues, optimizar la labor del Estado. Contando en la actualidad con más de un millón de usuarios ya autenticados que eh, eh, han representado realmente un logro para nosotros teniendo en cuenta el poco tiempo de implementación que llevamos ejecutando en esta estrategia. De manera que vamos en esa línea, eh, el gobierno decidido y con políticas generales y muy puntuales ocupando eh, ya hoy, por ejemplo, el tercer lugar en el índice de gobierno digital de la OCDE en el año 2019. Somos el séptimo país en el índice de GovTech elaborado por el Banco del Desarrollo, Desarrollo de América Latina, CAF, liderando la región de Iberoamérica. También, según el Our Data Index del 2019 de la OCDE y el Barómetro de Datos Abiertos de América Latina en el 2020, somos el tercer país en preparación de implementación e impacto de datos abiertos. Esto por citar algunos referentes que además nos envían un mensaje muy importante Pareciera que Colombia entonces va por la línea indicada de fortalecerse en conectividad y en transformación digital eh, hacia donde nos debemos todos dirigir. Thank you, Minister. It's been a pleasure working with Colombia. Knowing that we only have a few minutes left, I asked my colleague uh, Elsa to be as brief as she can be. And Elsa, can you give us some insights on what it takes to make the leap from e-government to, to digital government? 
and share some takeaways that you might have for developing or emerging countries. Elsa. Yes, thank you very much. I'll, I'll be very short. But just I think we need to define what we mean from moving from e-government to digital government. And this, in our own uh, wording, means going beyond putting online what was on paper and using the digital transformation as really an opportunity to redesign the relationship between government and citizens, and also uh, using the power of digital tools and data and people-centered services. So we've seen, I mean, we've heard many great examples today from India, Colombia, and others, and, and, but this really requires us what we call a strategic governance model across government silos, able to invest money strategically on digital programs, de develop the right skills, and to adopt you know, agile methodologies for, for digital procurement. I would say we have three, four lessons learned. So first, solid governance is a key requirement for a mature digital government. So that means that this must be embedded in the right institutional models to secure the necessary leadership, coordination, resources, legitimacy to transform you know, high-level policies into public services. Um, second, we have um, clearly that the countries that are the more digitally mature uh, present higher levels of engagement with citizens, businesses, civil servants across policy cycles to align the design and delivery of policies and services. Third, we need consistent capacity to plan invest in uh, digital public goods and also that promote you know, scalability and portability. And fourth, uh, I would say, and this is a little bit the new frontiers, uh, that will be governments and institutions that are able to make rules and standards that can shape the digital transformation in the future that, in a way that aligns with our values. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Elsa. Let me now give the last word to Minister Diatara. Uh, Minister, it's really inspiring to hear about the digital transformation in Senegal. Based on your experience, could you tell us how the global forums that develop policy standards in Syria could become more inclusive? Minister. Oui, je voudrais euh, souligner que la digitalisation des secteurs prioritaires tels que l'agriculture, le commerce, la santé, le tourisme, l'éducation, mais également l'institutionnalisation du forum donc de Dakar tous les deux ans et la création de la loi sur la promotion de la start-up au Sénégal sont autant d'initiatives gouvernementales qui contribuent à rendre le secteur numérique beaucoup plus attrayant et performant. Mais également, nous avons beaucoup appris et écouté les collègues qui ont partagé donc avec nous donc des expériences très intéressantes et que vous pouvez même consulter pour nous, donc, du, du benchmark par rapport aux bonnes pratiques, donc, au niveau international. Donc, euh, en Inde, nous avons subi euh, ce qui se fait sur l'identité numérique, les paiements numériques, mais également la protection des données. Et sur ce plan, le Sénégal a été, donc, retenu comme pays référence par l'Alliance la, Smart Africa, donc, dans le cadre, donc, de la protection des données. Et aujourd'hui, le Sénégal dispose, comme je l'ai dit tantôt, d'infrastructures numériques de classe mondiale, comme les data centers certifié tiers trois qui aujourd'hui donc participe à renforcer la protection des données donc des citoyens aussi bien sénégalais que de de, de l'Afrique de l'Ouest donc ce plutôt simplement que le Sénégal aujourd'hui donc est très bien positionné pour que le numérique puisse jouer pleinement son son rôle et sa partition donc dans le développement économique et social de notre pays et je pense que les expériences partagées avec les autres collègues mais également donc cette exercice de l'OCDE qui permet également donc de partager donc sur la problématique de la gouvernance d'internet de manière globale donc nous aidera beaucoup à renforcer donc notre positionnement donc mais également à euh, faire du, du numérique comme nous le voyons nous tous aujourd'hui comme un levier de croissance comme un secteur donc catalyseur de tous les secteurs économiques du pays en tout cas vous féliciter vous remercier encore pour euh, cette euh, belle opportunité que vous nous donnez de participer à cette réflexion au niveau international. Félicitations et merci beaucoup, Minister, pour le dernier mot. Um, this has been a great um, conversation. I think we could take it on quite a bit longer. I'm, I'm sorry I have to bring it to a close, but I, I, I want to keep the proceedings on time. And in fact, we've, we're, we're just on time. With that, I will directly hand the floor to the moderator of the next panel, Kate Wilson. But please, I want to thank uh, all the panelists for a, a great contribution this afternoon.
Kate. Thank you very much, Andy. And um, I want to also thank everyone who just spoke. And also, uh, I'm really looking forward to this separate uh, and second part of the conversation. So really in the panel one, we started to look at what were some of the policy frameworks that were in place that would really sort of enable this just digital transformation. And we started to touch a little bit on what were some of the areas where digital cooperation will really take off and actually help support those goals. And I want to pick up on something that Minister Diatara just mentioned, which is like, why are we doing any of this? You know, so sometimes when we begin to talk about technology, and I'm a technologist myself by training, um, we tend to talk about the technology, but we don't necessarily cover what is the outcome that we're doing this for. And the real purpose for all of this is to make people's lives easier to deliver services, to ensure that we have healthcare and education and agricultural services. And so I think it's important that as we talk about cooperation and systems interoperability, that we focus also on human interoperability of kind of digital cooperation to actually help make that possible. And so I'm really excited today to talk to our panelists about how will we be covering each of these. And I'm gonna turn first to Minister Soiree from Sierra Leone. I actually, in full disclosure, returned last evening from Sierra Leone, so he and I got a chance to speak last week. Um, but Minister, I was wondering, could you talk a little bit about the experience that Sierra Leone is undertaking in really setting and shaping your national digital transformation and how you are laying out sort of the policy frameworks for that and how international cooperation and national cooperation on the ground is really helping enable that? Thank you. Um, good day, all. Um, it's, it's quite a pleasure being here. <clears throat> um, so Sierra Leone has embarked on a long journey to digital transformation. Um, in 2018, we discovered that we were not meeting major international obligations. Um, African governments had all signed to the Malabo Accord which is the African Union gold standard for cybersecurity and data protection. We also discovered that we had not fulfilled the ECOWAS directives, which also talks about data protection and cybersecurity. And if you cannot meet the national and regional ones, there is little chance that you could meet the global standards. So we embarked on this journey. We developed um, um, a national um, digital transformation policy um, that was approved by cabinet. More recently, um, we have laid the National Digital um, Development Strategy, um, which is already receiving the attention of cabinet. Um, that document lays out a comprehensive um, roadmap by which Sierra Leone desires to unleash our potentials to be able to deliver digital goods and services to our citizenry at affordable uh, costs. So there are several plans of this um, National Digital Development Strategy. We have, for example, the governance, coordination, and partnerships. Under that pillar, we seek to address key gaps in policy and legislation to be able to support the government's vision of um, delivering um, digital services to every Sierra Union. At the same time, being able to um, pull together all of the partners whether local or development partners in the ecosystem to be able to deliver those services. The second one has to do with digital skills and human capital development. Under that plank, we seek to develop digital skills and capacity building of our citizens to be able to be competitive in the global digital ecosystem. Again, there is digital governance as the third pillar. Under digital governance, like somebody mentioned, one of the speakers before me um, noted that this is a transition from e-governance to digital governance. Um, under this pillar, we seek to prove to build the necessary um, platforms to be able to deliver public goods to the citizens. For example, Australian citizens um, living in far-flung communities, if they wish to secure a passport today or a national ID card, they will have to travel to free time. We seek under this pillar to be able to deliver um, um, public goods um, with least hassle and at affordable prices. We also wish to talk about emerging technology, innovation, and digital entrepreneurship. Under that, 
we want to be able to create the necessary ecosystem to um, grow innovation and to excite our citizens to innovate, to be able to resolve common national problems. Again, there is the issue of data governance and cybersecurity. Somebody mentioned um, digitalization is a double-edged sword. I quite agree with that extensively. Um, there are many good things that happens as a result of digitalization. We want to be able to promote democracy. We want to be able to promote good governance. We want to be able to promote, to protect our, our, our users in cyberspace. But at the same time, there is need to, to promote um, cyber hygiene, cyber security. So last year, Sierra Leone, with support from development partners, the Council of Europe, um, under the Glacier Plus program, was supported to develop a national cyber security and crime bill, which is in conformity with the Malabo Accord, um, the ECOWAS Directive, and aspires to the ideas of the Budapest Convention. So um, we are family on course. We understand it's a long journey, but we are committed to getting there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister Soare. Um, Teke, I think you're well placed to actually begin to build upon in part the minister's comments. Could you talk a little bit about the work that the Africa Digital Rights Hub is doing really to um, work across the continent on issues such as data protection, cybersecurity, and child protection. Um, this is a critical policy element um, that I'm so pleased that Sierra Leone has done and, and as India highlighted earlier is also working on. Could you talk a bit about your work in that? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. And uh, thanks for the organizers of this timely event. Um, what we are seeing, as we've heard, I think, throughout the discussions of the day, has been the increasing use of technologies, especially across Africa. Now, um, we've seen a lot of infrastructure development in the last uh, couple of decades, and, and it's yielding some significant re returns on, on the continent. However, what is also increasingly being exposed is that we are seeing the gaps that continue to exist in the policy and legal frameworks that support, enable trust, and protect citizens of the continent. And, and these risks are very real because in as much as, you know, we are seeing issues such as the di digital divide, what we continue to also see is that Africa is not behind when it comes to its adoption and use of modern technologies. So we are faced with the same modern challenges as the developed world will be. However, when you look at our policy and legal frameworks, we continue to see a gap. And, and this gap is really calling for cooperation and collaboration in order to enable us address it. One of the significant things that we continue to see across the continent has been, you know, the, the development of laws around cybersecurity, electronic transactions or e-commerce, data protection and the like. However, we are still seeing a lot of these laws being adopted based on frameworks uh, from the developed world, which do not necessarily sit within our respective countries and the dynamic nature that even when you look at the continent still exists. And what it's really calling for is the need to build, you know, um, expertise, local expertise around these uh, frameworks and policies to actually enable countries adopt, uh, you know, policies and laws that are best suited for them. Um, and so whilst countries are working and we're seeing some development in the area, there are still gaps. And what tends out to happen with these gaps is that you tend to have data protection laws in a number of countries. However, we're seeing significant challenges around implementation of these laws, which means that the, the purpose for passing these laws are not necessarily being met. We're also seeing capacity challenges, right? We've seen African countries um, ideally looking up to the GDPRs of the world to implement. However, if you go out there and head count the number of data protection, um, you know, 
privacy or certified officers or people with that uh, skill set to enable them implement, you see a huge gap. And so it, it's really time, and that's where we come in to try and help organizations and, and countries and even a private sector really understand what this means in terms of their or particular ecosystem, how to localize these laws to ensure that they're able to put in place an enabling environment that speaks to the, the, the context of their the country speaks to the context of, you know, the situation and circumstances under which they operate, because they're equally important. Thank you so much, Teke. And you really talked a lot about the increase demand for um, not just on the side of the data privacy and protection and the capacity there, but also the ability to actually implement and enforce in seeing that. And I know that this is something um, as part of a broader trend in digital transformation that UNDP is seeing quite a bit of. And Robert Opp, um, who is the chief of digital for the UNDP has joined us today. And so Robert, delighted to welcome you here. You, you know, the UNDP has really seen this sharp increase um, since the pandemic began. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the types of support that countries are asking for and how Minister Soare and Tege's comments sort of resonate with you. And what do you think will be critical to enable an effective response from sort of UNDP, but also the entire UN system, as well as other partners to really help provide that additional support over the next few years? Thanks so much, Kate. And, and uh, it's great to be here and be part of uh, the, this event as well. Um, you're absolutely right. And there's a lot of resonance with what was said uh, just now, but a COVID uh, pandemic really has been an inflection point um, on a lot of this sort of digital acceleration, and that's been widely acknowledged. Um, what we saw uh, coming out of COVID were hundreds upon hundreds of requests for different kinds of support and the ways that different countries were looking at how they can actually respond quickly to the pandemic, but then going much beyond that. So we had uh, we saw requests for basic di digital infrastructure and capacity building of civil servants for uh, business continuity, health system support, online education, e-commerce platforms for informal traders, data platforms to help make um, you know insights work better. Um, but then, interestingly, we also have have seen since then a trend toward more of these policy issues um, that Teke was just mentioning, and some of the ideas around the national digital transformation strategies. Um, and so, you know, in taking all of this. You know, we've learned and identified a few learnings out of this, which is, um, I think, already acknowledged in the previous panel, uh, countries that had invested more and more and had more efficient and effective digital infrastructure were able to respond much uh, faster to the, the, the pandemic. And Colombia was mentioned as an example in the first panel. Um, Bangladesh is another one. Pakistan's another one. And um, I know I don't have time to go into those, but they're fascinating examples. Um, but we also know digital divide is a major challenge, um, including the gender divide and the, the, let's call it the poverty divide between least developed countries and, and others. We also know digital approaches within uh, countries are very often fragmented and that hinders their effectiveness. And then we know that uh, we need to be, when we use digital, we need to be intentionally inclusive about what we do with the right protections in place, which is what Teke was just mentioning as well. And Minister Suare talked about the double-edged sword of digital. And so it's really important that we understand that. Um, and so our approach that, that we've come to as an organization working with our partners um, is that we really, need to, we, we really need to approach digital work and digital transformation holistically and strategically. None of these challenges can be addressed in isolation. We really need to think at a, at a whole of society level about how we can bring these uh, approaches and this kind of work together. Um, and so we're, uh, we're currently working with about 30 countries in different stages on these sort of national level digital strategy approaches, um, because that seems to be also where the demand is really about making it coherent and effective. Um, and then an important part of that, which has also come up and is, I'm sure, going to come up again in this conversation, is identifying the right kinds of infrastructure. And for that, we see digital public goods, 
that um, have somewhat of a bias toward interoperability and openness, we see these as really important um, platforms to build on. And those, uh, that's why we're so pleased to be part of the Digital Public Goods Alliance, working with Norway, with Germany. Um, we work with Dial and UK on the GovStack and other initiatives, really exciting stuff. And it's important for what we're doing. Thanks so much. And, you know, I think you highlighted the importance of not working in isolation and really um, as we engage with each of these countries. And I want to bring in now sort of the mobile operator perspective. And John, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about sort of the changes that mobile operators have really seen and the role that they play in kind of digital transformation in low and middle income countries. And you know, kind of from your perspective, how can development cooperation actors, um, including public bodies and partner organizations, work more cooperatively with the private sector? And what are some examples um, of both constraints, <laughs> but also opportunities where you see that we can build our work together more effectively in the future to really achieve this vision? Absolutely. Well, thank, thank you so much, Kate, um, for having me. Thanks to the OECD for the invitation. I think it's really important that we have the private sector here as well to, to deal and cop with um, our colleagues in government, with international institutions, because I think that this cooperation and development is really going to be key to sustainability. So um, in, uh, from our perspective at the GSMA, our members basically consist of every mobile operator in the world, so in all corners of the globe. They're working to accelerate digital growth and importantly to make sure that they have more people um, subscribing to the networks and making sure they're leaving as few people behind as possible. Um, now, given the reach of mobile networks, we at the GSMA decided we should really work to build a platform for collaboration between, our, between the industry, with governments, with international institutions. I think also notably with the development community. So through our Mobile for Development program, we, we've tried to bring these stakeholders together so that they're more tied in to um, sustainable commercial or private sector solutions to some of the challenges they face. And I think so far we've been quite fortunate that we have uh, seen success in this collaborative approach. Um, to date, we've been able to document direct and positive impact on the lives of 126 million people through the work. Obviously a lot more to do. Um, and I think given the scale of the challenges we're facing, I mean, the multiple crises that we see, the um, pandemic um, and the reality that that brought about the importance of digital connectivity I think no one actor, no one government, no one industry is going to be able to do it alone. Um, so I think that the pandemic, we felt the need to continue with mobile broadband infrastructure, continue to try to look at innovative services, but we need to make sure we are partnering with governments and meeting the requirements they see for citizens, um, and also with the development community to make sure that they're able to use digital solutions to respond to, for example, the humanitarian crisis now in Ukraine or in, um, in other regions of the world. Um, and I think one of the things we've seen or observed generally is the continued growth of connectivity. Last year was the first time ever we were able to document that more than half of the world's population was connected to the mobile internet. Um, but of course, the flip side of that is that means almost half is not. Um, so given the importance of digital solutions to delivering the development agenda, um, you know, we want to work very closely with governments, with the development community, with international institutions to make sure we're tackling the right issue. Um, I think in chapter four of the OECD's development cooperation report um, this year, the biggest challenge is actually not infrastructure. I mean, it is a big challenge, but it's not the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge is a lack of adoption. Um, so 89% of people who are not using mobile internet today live in areas that are covered by the mobile internet. And of course, as we've already heard, women are in all areas disproportionately impacted. So, you know, a real, a real need to focus on bridging that gender gap. But the research we've seen in terms of what we need to tackle, I mean, first and foremost, we've seen the main issue is a lack of digital skills. The second issue is affordability of handsets. Of course, this can come into issues just, of course, the cost of handsets, the lack of um, the right types of handsets for certain markets, and of course, importantly, taxation on, ta on handsets. Um, safety and security remain concerns, and of course, lack of relevant content in some cases, or local content, I should say. Um, so the framework we've been using for mobile, develop for mobile for Development is to bring the development community together, whether it be FCDO, NORAD, CEDA, Australia Aid, the Gates Foundation, through our 401c3 foundation, bring them together. Then we act as an interface with the industry to sort of provide 
sort of um, seed funding and innovations to bring solutions to the, that the development community wants, that the mobile operators think are sustainable, and that ultimately, and I love your point up front about human interoperability, that actually work for people. Um, so our solutions, I mean, I, I won't go into all of them because we don't have time, but I just give two quick ones. Um, you know, I, I mentioned, of course, this challenge on, um, on digital skills. We work with support of FCDO, CEDA, as well as some research funded by NORAD to develop um, something we call MIST, the Mobile Internet Skills Training Toolkit. And thanks to the use and deployment of this through a mobile operator, particularly MTN in Sub-Saharan Africa, in a very short period of time, we've been able to bring 21 million more people learning how to safely navigate and use the mobile internet. And I, I, one last point, go given the sort of ongoing humanitarian crises around the world, of course, Ukraine is one, but there's many others. Um, we are also working to bring mobile operators together with the humanitarian agencies, such as UNHCR, as well as the impacted governments, so that we can address some of the challenges. That because I mean, one of the things we're immediately seeing here in the situation in Europe, we saw this, of course, in Uganda as well, refugees arrive, KYC requirements make it difficult for mobile operators to provide SIM cards. So therefore they're automatically excluded until we can address that challenge. So these are just some of the ways I think collaboration is key to achieving, our, I think what is shared objectives. Mobile operators want more subscribers, um, governments want more citizens connected and humanitarian agencies and development agencies want to expand inclusion. Um, so I think, you know, through platforms like this one today, I think we can continue that dialogue and make progress. Thank you so much, John. And um, I really loved in particular some of your earlier points on sort of movement to inclusivity. And um, I wanted to now turn to the Director General from Kenya um, because I've been so impressed to see the steps that Kenya has taken to really put inclusiveness at the heart of your regulatory strategy. Could you talk a bit, um, please, sir, about the success factors that have enabled you to balance this objective with also supporting the vibrant digital growth in Kenya, um, which has been a standout in the region? Thank you very much uh, for this invitation and allowing us to participate and, and to share insights about the digital transformation agenda. Now, if you know that Kenya, the, the current Kenya is nested in a, a history, which I may call a history of the last 20 years, when we had a new total, uh, a new governance uh, system led by a new political dispensation uh, around 2002. And that created an opportunity for envisioning the future or the socioeconomic well-being of our people. And that ended up being captured in what we now refer to as uh, our long-term uh, policy vision that is not just long-term, but also providing that global perspective about the future socioeconomic development of the country. That is vision 2030, which puts ICT as a key enabler of the future development of the country. And as a result of that uh, long-term uh, framework, we also went into having a new constitutional dispensation in the year 2010. And if you look at how the constitution is set up, it provides for key principles around how we lead uh, as leaders and how we lead on policy and development. And one of the key principles that is emphasized is equality and freedom from discrimination. That each and every citizen must be treated equally. And it goes even further to identify uh, marginalized uh, groups of people who have historically been left behind to have to, for government departments to have uh, policy interventions that will allow this group of people to be mainstreamed in the social economic development of the country. So the basis now, one is the long-term perspective that we had uh, under Vision 2030. Then we have the constitutional principles that encourage equality uh, and freedom from discrimination, which it basically means every development agenda must be inclusive. But in addition to that, of course, setting up the Ministry of ICT, uh, specifically targeting this particular area was very, very instrumental with appropriate leadership. If you look at the current ICT policy framework, we still emphasize that idea that ICT, everything else is gonna converge around ICT. And we must ensure therefore that other than promoting uh, uh, ICT from a market perspective, we must also ensure that it's as inclusive as much as possible. And what has happened over time then, 
we've seen innovation leading to more uh, decentralized, efficient way of delivery of services. So, and this decentralization means that as many, uh, as uh, many Kenyans as much as possible are able to access the value of ICT. So government adopts a more open-minded uh, policy that allows inclusion, uh, having this long-term perspective, I think that has worked to add a uh, great value uh, to the growth of the industry. Now, we recently just started a new, um, uh, uh, we, we, we launched a new policy framework, uh, 2020, and we are looking at the emerging forms of technologies and how then we're going to harness these new technologies to allow the markets to grow, but at the same time to ensure that we reduce the gap between the haves and have nots. We reduce the digital gap in between. And finally, this investment has been demonstrated from um, in actual terms, in terms of government's commitment by setting up what we call the Universal Service Fund, which is a special fund that we use actually to be able to ensure that even in areas where there is no um, uh, adequate or number of, of population or consumers for subscribers, uh, in terms of connectivity, these people, uh, people living in these particular areas are also able to access uh, the value of the benefits arising from uh, connectivity. So we've done that. And with that intervention today, we, we are proud to say that up to 96.4% of Kenyans actually have access to uh, uh, network connectivity. But of course, there's a challenge there. Um, connectivity is one thing, but uh, opportunity to connect is one thing, but the actual connectivity in terms of day-to-day -day experiences with the technology, we still have a challenge there. Why? Because a lot more people are not able to access devices. So the market structure is such that only those who are able to afford can be able to enjoy the full benefits available by technology. So the question is, how then do we ensure that uh, low-income groups, uh, uh, sections of society, um, are able to actually access devices that, uh, smart devices in particular, that are able to maximize the potential provided by, uh, by technology. So at that particular level, I would say, it is policy uh, and opportunity available by, uh, avail, uh, by, uh, by, avail by the technology itself, the leadership that is appropriate and being open-minded in terms of the emerging technologies that then you can be able to deploy uh, to move uh, society forward. Thank you so much. And um, I just want to pick up on a couple of things um, and also congratulate you as well for the digital transformation framework. I know it's a blueprint that many in the on the subcontinent are looking at as we speak. Um, and it's a very impressive piece. And I also want to tie in a little bit with the the how you increase demand from people to actually then use it. So once, as you said, you can connect, you can tie in. And I think it's a really interesting time to kind of turn and look now a bit at the experience of Estonia. And so I invite Ambassador Leos to kind of um, join the conversation and talk a bit about, you know, sort of the journey that Estonia made from, you know, sort of setting out as Kenya has done sort of many years ago, a long-term vision, but then really building the digital infrastructure and digital public goods that then encouraged people because it was each of those services that then enabled Estonia really to drive its digital transformation journey. And so I was wondering, you know, as you think about um, Nelly, sort of the increased demand for support, could you talk a little bit about the journey that Estonia has made, but also the priorities for collective action, maybe within a country, but also beyond to help um, drive down some of the fragmentation and duplication of efforts that exist both at the global and at the national level. Thank you. Uh, first, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And, um, and my second thank you actually goes for the, for the OECD to, for putting digital public goods higher in the digital cooperation agenda. And, and of course, Kate, thank you. My third thank you for, uh, for, for praising Estonia's efforts uh, in this because it is indeed so that that the development of open and let's say open source based um, digital society has been top priority for us, um, and this has been 
Then lastly, in the digital autonomy uh, sovereignty agenda, it has been an issue of um, national security, but of course it has been, as you said, part of our um, sort of digital DNA and, and we have been also sharing now, logically moving from national developments to, to global, sharing this um, experience with, um, with those who, who might find it useful. But, but actually, um, uh, the question about fragmentation and, uh, and application, it was exactly because of this we introduced um, digital public good, or let's say the open source-based um, uh, digital components in Estonian government. And I would have to go back in time around 20, 25 years ago uh, and, um, and perhaps give you a, a story of the, of the birth, I would say, of our most famous digital public good that is used for, for data sharing, uh, not in Estonia, but, but also in several other countries. And, and I remember that I was then working in the ministry responsible for digitalization when other organizations started to uh, fill their annual development plans and also wanted funding for these. And then we realized that, oh, uh, most of these plans are actually quite similar because all of the government uh, organizations needed to, to change or exchange data uh, with each other, but also with the private sector, either to fulfill their duties or to, uh, to provide better services um, uh, to, their, to their partners. And it was then actually when we realized that, that uh, the needs of government organizations are actually quite similar, uh, no matter which policy area they, uh, they work in. But of course, we couldn't also uh, fulfill their wishes because we simply didn't have any funding <laughs> For this at that time, so it was a combination of the aha effect that uh, we can actually do things differently, and uh, and the lack of um, uh, of financial resources. Uh, so we uh, stepped in shared, um, let's say, components and and also shared uh, shared services in Estonia, and it took a couple of years for us to understand that we actually do not even have to. Uh, develop and maintain these crucial components in digitalization to sort of avoid this application alone because other countries face the same issues. Uh, so we formed a, um, an alliance with, with Finland and now also Iceland is part of it, where we developed um, uh, a system for maintaining and funding these core digital public um, um, goods and uh, and of course, the very localization can be done in, in each of these countries uh, separately. So it has been this natural step or, or uh, evolution. And, uh, and it is now uh, part of our digital foreign policy also. We have several initiatives. Uh, Robert also mentioned GovStack that we are uh, doing together with uh, our partners from ITU Germany and, and, uh, uh, and Dial. And this is... Um, in order to sort of widen this grasp of these crucial principles of openness in, uh, in our digital development. And I am really glad also to announce today that uh, Estonia will also be joining the Digital Public Good Alliance, which will give us, of course, a possibility to share experiences with, with each other, but really to advocate for, uh, for digital uh, public goods and the philosophy behind it that has become, I would say, one of the components of our, our digital diplomacy or digital foreign policy also. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I think the story is just incredibly inspiring um, and offers sort of an opportunity to think about how we are going to cooperate more effectively. I wanna bring in now Germany actually and address a question to you, Martin. Um, you really, Germany has really been championing international cooperation for digital transformation through efforts such as the EU D4D hub, um, your efforts uh, with GovStack, and most notably in terms of the G7 presidency. As we look forward to kind of delivering this just digital transformation and um, think about increased support for digital public goods, such as Nelly just spoke about, um, could you talk about what other critical enablers are really required and how we might work together more effectively on digital cooperation? Good afternoon, Kate. Uh, good afternoon, y'all. Who 
owns the internet? Isn't the idea of a free and open internet still a very appealing vision? Especially in our days, now that business models in all sectors, e-agriculture to e-commerce, smart mobility, smart energy, industry, fodder dough, e-government are digitally transformed. It is our strong belief that the digital public goods represent an extremely relevant approach to digital transformation and development cooperation simultaneously. One that is neither putting profits first, nor the exploitation of citizens data, but instead focuses on supporting the global transition to a carbon neutral and peaceful world. A just twin transition is only possible if we add digital public goods to the mix, because too many countries are cut off from modern digital infrastructure. Too many people don't have access. Too much hardware is too expensive. Too much software is not open. Too much data is not public. So what other enablers are required? First, global standards and technical specifications like the DPG standard, since interoperability is one of the most crucial elements of a well-working system architecture and will be key for a cross-border collaboration. Second, regional regulatory frameworks that work for the people and protect their interests. Third, a strong local system integrator ecosystem leveraging private sector innovation and resources to support governments in the long run. And yes, Germany is utilizing its membership of the EU Digital Forward Development Hub, as well as the G7 presidency to co-design, promote and realize a human-centered inclusive approach of development cooperation and global coordination. Thank you. Um, so wanted to turn now and actually ask everyone just to do one quick rapid fire conversation where we can, um, uh, we can hopefully help capture this amazing panel. Um, so we're wondering a little bit, how can development cooperation, which much of you have touched on, really step up to the increased demand that we're seeing? And what do you think is the number one issue that development cooperation actors must respond to and what they need to change in order to make the shared vision that we've outlined here today really possible. So I'm gonna start first with you, Nelly. Thank you. Um, going back to the digital cooperation in the digital public good sort of framework, I believe we have actually quite a bit of awareness raising uh, um, uh, to do both among ourselves <laughs> but also those that, um, that we are working with. And, um, and there are a lot of myths associated with, um, yeah, with the digital public goods. Um, um, one of them, they don't need uh, a, a, lot of, um, a lot of money, which is actually uh, not true. Digital public goods, any digital cooperation uh, requires also financial resources. And, uh, and I believe that some of these myths also become obstacles uh, to bring in the private sector. And this was also mentioned um, uh, during our panel here, uh, the, the private sector also needs to uh, understand their uh, opportunities, even within the framework of digital public goods, because these opportunities are there. Uh, and it is our task also to, to find it out. But of course, uh, relatedly also to the local community building. And, uh, and, and here I would say that um, the public sector awareness um, about digital public goods is, um, uh, is as crucial as, um, as the private sector one. So I would um, just to conclude to, to combine the awareness and, um, and capacity. Okay, Thank awareness you. and capacity. Okay, thanks. So Teki, um, I'm gonna turn to you and ask uh, one, uh, one topic, one sentence, what do you think needs to be done and most needs to be changed? Um, what needs to be done? I think a lot more effort uh, has to go in. There's work being done, but um, we still have gaps, especially when you look at the continent. So more cooperation and collaboration on that. Uh, what needs to change is that we need to recognize Africa as a continent with 55 
countries um, that is very, very different. And each of the 55 countries are different. So uh, we should look at building or working with them to achieve uh, what, what, what is required rather than um, serving them with solutions that have worked in the West. A lot of the, the policies are good if you're looking at uh, broad principles, but when you bring down it down to how our uh, various countries work, usually we have difficulty around implementation. So we need to recognize that nuance in, in engaging on that. Great, thank you. So bring in a lot more voices and making sure we are, are designing really from the bottom. John, to you, so sort of one thing that we could do differently and uh, how do we change? Yeah, so I mean, I think so much of today's discussion pivots on people having access to, to digital. So to me, I mean, we have 43% of the world's population, 3.4 billion people live within coverage and aren't using it. So they, they could be digitally included if we could find ways to reach them. So that's going to require governments, international institutions, and industry to work together. And I think that's our biggest challenge. I think making sure that we all understand each other and can work better to to collaborate on whether it's digital skills, reducing taxation to make things more affordable. How can we can do these things together? I think that I think what's missing now, I think we recognize the problem more and more. I think we need to align our thinking both policy-wise, commercial-wise from the industry to um, actually then try to directly target that desired outcome. Fantastic. Minister Soiree, from your point of view, what's the number one issue we should be focusing on and what do we need to change in order to make this happen? Well, I, I thank you very much. I already highlighted the fact that we have an inclusive digital strategy, um, one that leaves no one behind. We have a situation where about 87% of our population is connected by mobile voice. We have about 32.4% connected um, on various platforms. So that is quite a huge gap. So we want to focus on real connectivity. So it is in that area that we want all the partnerships that we require. Um, that is what our first strategy in our, um, our digital development strategy speaks to, um, governance, coordination, and partnerships, so that we are able to leave no one behind. Because you have schools in those communities, you have hospitals there, you have everything in those communities. Um, they suffer um, all the disadvantages of the, there is a huge digital gap, right? There is little, or no digital literacy, um, the gap between the, the, the sexes is widening and all of those. So I think we have to focus on rural connectivity in every sense of the world. Universal service funds have tried, but they can only do so much. They are grossly in, insufficient to be able to do the to address the challenges. So really making sure all development cooperation is really aligned around the vision the government has laid out in its policy and strategy. So Martin, over to you. How do you think development cooperation, what do you think is the number one issue and what do you think um, we should do to change? What are you most excited about? The, the top issue is to make sure the digital transformation follows rules, social and ecological rules. It's not about technology for technology, technology's sake. We're talking way too much about these cool, small pilot projects and marketing passwords. What we really must take care of is to close the digital divide and adjust in carbon reducing way. This requires to focus our work on the basics, um, affordable internet access, sustainable data centers, eco-friendly hardware, green business models, open source software, open data, open content. And this is why, this is the reason why we, Germany, have included strengthening digital public goods and infrastructure in our G7 suggestions. And this is the reason why we think the charter for digital public goods is the right structure for the infliction point the world is at, uh, catering for bottom-up consultation, uh, global political movement, and tangible commitments and actions. Thank you. Ezra, I'm gonna turn over to you. Final thoughts. Uh, thank you. Uh, for me, uh, where I sit, I think uh, access to affordable smart devices to make technology meaningful must be our agenda. That's the only way we can say we are adequately, uh, efficiently deploying available resources for economic growth. And for us to be able to get there, uh, goes to your next question. What is the role of the 
global IT manufacturers in making sure that affordable smart devices are accessible, especially by uh, poor countries uh, around the world. Uh, so from a policy perspective, think about incentives that will get the global manufacturers pro, uh, pro, provide cheaper devices that are affordable by a majority of the population from around the world. Then lastly, the question of sustain, sustainability. Technology evolves. And sometimes the, 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 we invest $10 million today, but the cost of maintaining, maintaining that increases with time. So we must also be able to answer that question from a development perspective. So once you get into it, it's a continuous process. That, what we, that is what we must appreciate also. Thank you very much. Robert. Okay, well, I think most things have been said already, but um, you know, we, we just released a new digital strategy for the organization for UNDP, which sets out to create a world in which digital is an empowering force for people and planet. And so I think for us, the issue is really, really putting inclusion and sustainability at the heart of what we do in digital. Um, whether we're approaching the digital divide, digital public goods, digital policy issues, we have to have people at the heart of it. Um, but the way that we do that, I think, which has been mentioned many times, is really about, you know, taking um, a, a, a multi-stakeholder approach, an alliance type approach. This is why we're so pleased to be part of uh, the Digital Public Goods Alliance, working with um, with Dial and others. And you know, we're really excited about the the process of the DPG Charter that we've been talking about, which is a uh, coming together with um, Germany and Norway and other uh, Dial and other players uh, through the Digital Public Goods Alliance, and we're looking at this issue of how might we get global commitment around the use of digital public goods that really benefit people in the end. So it, for me, it's all about leaving no one behind, putting people at the heart of our work. Thank you so much. Um, I wanna thank you all for being such an inspiring panel. Uh, it's been just an absolute pleasure. Um, I think you struck on some really core issues of um, really, as Robert just said, you know, putting people at the heart and really making sure that it's an inclusive future, making sure that we don't forget uh, the fundal Im fundamental infrastructure needs of connectivity, uh, tariffs, affordability of handsets, making sure that we have an inclusive policy future. Um, in our chapter in the OECD report, we really talked about kind of what we say that are the five Ps really of what's gonna be needed to um, for development cooperation. And it's really looking at the politics that guide um, this type of transformation, thinking about the people first policies, but also the training of people that are required, um, the policy environment, as Teki and um, Minister Schwere and, and Ezra sort of highlighted that are really meant to be a sort of fundamental underpinning and then Jira talked about at the beginning, the pricing and procurement of the cost of these digital public goods, but then themselves, the products themselves. Um, so we're excited to see all of you here today and I'll hand it back over to Ida and thank, thank the OECD again for your really strong leadership and making sure that we are all thinking about how to shape a just digital transformation. Thank you very much, Kate. And thanks to Andy and thanks to every single panelist for engaging with the technology <laughs> um, and, and, and participating uh, in, in this online line event. Thanks to the audience for, for staying with us. Um, you know, we, it's lovely to have in-person meetings, um, but we benefit from being an online world where we can really, I don't think we would have managed to get such an excellent panel together uh, in, 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 in a real, uh, in a physical space. Um, I would like to thank uh, everyone who was instrumental in putting this event together. Um, and let me just mention in particular, um, Eleanor Carey, Katharina Zetzinger, Jonas Wilkes, um, our boss Rahul Malhotra and the management in DCD. I'd like to thank Kerry Elgar, Jessica Boris, Stephanie Koik, Joel Basul, Henri Bernard Sonniak to count Ola Kazneshi from the comm side especially who have done an amazing work in, in pulling this report together. Our wonderful partners, Dial, uh, UNDP, Rob, I'm sorry I didn't mention you at the outset, but Rob and Yolanda, uh, the colleagues at the Digital Public Goods Alliance from across OECD, STI, Gov, Tax, so all who contributed, the DAC members um, who, who enable uh, this report to, to be done. 
um, and all the many contributors for the rich and informative uh, contributions. So um, we can, we're on time. Uh, let me uh, thank you all again. Uh, invite uh, everyone to continue to interact in social media. You can look at, back at this event on YouTube. I think a link has been put, put in, the, in the chat. Um, and as we approach the weekend, let me uh, wish you all also a wonderful week. So many thanks. Merci beaucoup. Et muchas gracias. Au revoir. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.